forecasting is a very important um, uh, process or a very important uh, tool mm -hmm. for planning purposes. It allows organizations to be able to forecast things like such as demand, forecast supply, and use that information uh, to plan more effectively. So what is forecasting? It's really a process for predicting uh, future events. So we could, if we're going to have a ball game and we want to sort of uh, decide what kind of uh, concessions we need to provide. So if we could forecast the numbers, we are better able to plan inventory. Uh, we're better able to plan for services, plan for security, on all those sorts of things, right? Um, so we use it in all sorts of um, businesses and for all sorts of uh, situations. We're, not, we're talking about planning production, inventory, personnel, facilities, capacity, and so forth. So it is fairly prevalent. When we forecast, we often need a planning horizon, and then we often would consider the relationship between the planning horizon and the nature of the of the situation that we want to forecast for. So for example, if you're forecasting in a strategic environment, you tend to look at more long-term forecasts. If you're looking at the sort of immediate uh, to short-term environment, then you need short-term forecasts. So we usually think of three ranges, sort of short range, um, probably up to a year, but typically monthly, weekly, or quarterly. And then medium range forecasts can be up to three months to three years, and long range forecasts three years or more. So, as I, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, planning hierarchy, the short-term forecast tend to be more associated with sort of day-to-day -day decisions, or week-to-week -week or month-to-month. -month. Long-range, however, tend to be much more strategic in nature. So, there are some differences. Um, as you could see here that um, medium to long term forecast deals with more comprehensive issues and support management decisions regarding planning and products and plants and processes. Things that tend to remain for several years. If you locate a plant, you're not going to change its location on a monthly basis. So you want to look in the long term and decide whether or not if you locate in Sydney versus if you locate in Yarmouth or versus if you locate in Halifax or Dartmouth, what are the long term implications of that decision? Short term usually uh, employs different methodologies than long term forecasting. And short term forecasts tend to be more accurate than longer term forecasts. These happen to be some features that are prevalent in the forecasting um, process. The influence of product life cycle, depending on where you are in the product life cycle, there's some relationship to the forecasting approaches that you use. <coughs> in the introductory stages, um, in that case, demands are typically low. Things are highly variable. You're making a lot of uh, design changes, and you may not very well uh, have a good handle on forecast accuracy at that point. Uh, but as you sort of get into the growth stage of the life cycle, then forecasting becomes critical. Uh, trend models tend to be useful here because you, you, you're pretty much experiencing some growth and um, the growth could be linear, it could be curvy linear, but nonetheless you could use some sort of linear approximation to that growth. In the mature stage, the demand is fairly stable, and so the types of techniques you would tend to use are the ones that um, does not really try to project any trend, moving averages, uh, naive method, exponential smoothing, uh, tools like that. And in the decline stage, you have a sort of a trend, but the trend is trending downwards, and you can still use some trend models uh, in a case like that. So the stage of the life cycle does certainly influence the uh, techniques that you use. Well, there are different types of forecasts, um, macroeconomic forecasts, technological forecasts, demand forecasts. Within the context of, of an organization, you may very well want to do all of those. So what is the likely impact of the economy on your organization? You may want to do some economic forecasting. What's the likely impact of technology? How will technology change over time? And uh, you would certainly want to consider that as well. Demand forecasts, where you focus in on predicting sales for the products that you have existing within your facility, then you would want to do that kind of forecasting, all right?
strategic importance of forecasting, um, hiring resources, capacity, man managing the supply chain, deciding where to locate facilities, distribution centers, warehouses, all of those have much more strategic implications as opposed to your know, more tactical and operational implications. There are several steps in developing a forecast. Um, uh, most organizations, when you talk to them uh, about how they actually go about forecasting, they will tell you that they do not necessarily use a formal, a formal process. And so um, they would look at historical data and then make some assumptions about what the future is going to look like. In most cases, they would just adjust the quantities from history by some sort of percentage. If they believe that there might be some sort of 10% improvement, they would just adjust that. But then there are more formal, there's a more formal approach to forecasting, which we ought to consider. So we usually um, decide what we're going to use the forecast for, what are we going to forecast, however, how long a period quarterly for the next week, for the next month, for the next year. And then we have several models. And sometimes it's not always known ahead of time which is the best model. So we would select forecasting models, gather the data, historical data, and then make some predictions. And then compare the predictions with the actual to see how good the forecasting models perform. And then you pick one to you to make the forecast. And then you validate your results, which basically means that you will check to the next period to see to what extent your forecast is actually close to reality. Some realities for sure is that forecasts are seldom perfect. Most techniques assume an underlying system. If you did not assume an underlying system, then what's the point of forecasting? You may as well put numbers on a dartboard and then throw a uh, data item and whichever number gets picked, you pick that. But it's because we believe that there is some underlying causal system, hence we are trying to predict that system. We, we are sort of trying to, to mimic its behavior, hoping that we actually capture the inaccurate forecast. All right? Product family and aggregated forecasts are more accurate than individual product forecasts. So when you, if you t say for example, let's forecast the sale of winter tires for 2013, well, that's a lot easier to do uh, than to try to forecast the sale of size 13 tires, 14 tires, 15 tires, those that are steel belted, those are, you know, that are not steel belted, whatever. Um, if you, when, once you disaggregate the product, then it's a lot harder to come up with the individual forecast. When you aggregate it, the highs and lows of one product will actually offset the highs and lows of another and therefore you get a fairly stable demand pattern which makes it easier to forecast. All right? So what are some approaches that we can use for forecasting? Well, they're both qualitative methods and quantitative methods. Qualitative methods tend to be used when you don't have a lot of data, hard data. And uh, in a lot of cases when a product is newly introduced and so forth, um, we don't have a lot of historical information, you may tend to use qualitative forecasting. So use when a situation is vague, little data exists, so new products, new technology uh, involves intuition and experience. Example, forecasting sales on the internet. If you don't have a whole lot of history with sales pattern on the internet, it's kind of difficult to forecast that, so you'd have to make some judgments. There are quantitative methods, and some of them are called time series methods, which basically means that the data is ordered chronologically, and that's where time comes in. Um, and then you have uh, those that are not necessarily time series models, where you have this sort of associative relationship between multiple variables. So using a situation where that is stable, historical data exists, and you could actually apply it to existing products or current technology involves mathematical techniques such as forecasting sales of color televisions. All right. Let's just talk very quickly about a few of the qualitative models. Uh, jury of executive opinion. So what happens is you have a group of people that are supposed to be fairly high level experts, they have some experience and you want to ask their opinion. Simple as this. And then based on, on, on the information you get, you could actually put them together. If you ask five people and their values are different, you could average that or you could kind of uh, just kind of get a sense from each and every one of them 
as to the rationale for their particular predictions, and then you decide. Delphi method, a panel of experts is queried iteratively. And what we mean by that is that each uh, person on the panel is asked for a forecast. And uh, that information is then collected and circulated back to the group without um, indicating who actually made the forecast. What tends to happen is that you look at your own forecast, if you're on the panel, look at your own forecast relative to the forecast of others, and then decide if you want to make an adjustment. So the second round, we will find people actually adjusting their forecast by examining the forecast of the other members of the panel. So if you were, for example, if your forecast happened to have been an outlier, uh, you might want to shift a little closer to the other forecasts that were provided. And so, of course, there is a sort of psychological uh, element to this. All right? Salesforce Composite, if you have a number of salespeople, you ask each of them uh, to forecast sales in their region, and then you roll that up to a forecast, an aggregate forecast for the entire organization. Of course, the consumer market surveys can certainly help. Um, if you go to Costco, for example, you see a lot of people um, are actually uh, sa providing samples. Well, they gauge the reaction, and that's a form of a market survey. When you gauge that reaction, if people are enthusiastic about a the product, then you extrapolate that to the general population. Okay. I'm going to skip those because um, it's sort of giving you a sense of what's involved in these areas. Quantitative approaches. So, as I mentioned, uh, there are two big groups, time series models and the associative models. And with time series models, the data is chronologically ordered, so we feel that there is some sort of connection between time and the, the underlying causal system. All right. A naive approach is a very simple approach that basically says um, our near future will look like our not too distant past. So our near future will look like our near past sort of a thing. Okay, um, I'll get into the models, let me continue, but just review the slide here. Um, for time series forecasts, you typically have evenly spaced numerical data, so for example, monthly data, weekly data, daily data, okay, quarterly data, obtained by observing response to variable at regular time periods. And the forecast is only based on past values, no other variables are, are, are important, so hence, we believe that time is an important uh, element to this. Right? Time series have four components to them, trend, seasonality, cyclical variation, and random, what we cannot predict. So trend, I think we, we have a sense, is this kind of um, general you know, steady upward movement or downward movement, right? And um, the seasonal, is when within within a year, if you have this sort of uh, periodic pattern. So, for example, um, if you were to take week by week, uh, we see the variation of demand um, during the week, and that cycle repeats itself. So, Monday, Mondays, the, the Monday demands look similar, the Tuesday demands look similar, the Wednesday demands look similar, and so you'll see a similar profile across from week to week. Or it could be quarterly. Right, so first quarter look, you know, the first quarters look alike, the second quarters look alike, third quarters look alike, and so on. Then, of course, um, there is the uh, cyclical component, which typically goes beyond a year. So we could think about economic cycles. If we look at uh, the fishing industry, the cycles with respect to population of particular species. Um, and then every five years, perhaps the codfish declines, and that's more of a cycle. And then there's, of course, what we cannot explain. Running through our data also tends to be this um, level amount, a constant. And all these other parts are just adjustments to that constant. For example, trend pulls this up in this direction. Seasonality pulls parts of it up and down and so forth. Okay, so I've already explained those um, trend component basically is persistent over time. It could be upward or downward. All right, 
um, seasonal components. If we go back to that, just say that there are fluct periodic fluctuations. Uh, for example, um, according to, we could do it quarterly, we could do it according to the seasons, the fall, the winter, summer and spring, and so forth. All right? Or it could be happening within a day. If you, if you were to go to a, um, say a supermarket or a bank and you examine the, the queues right, at different times of the day, you will see certain patterns where maybe perhaps early in the morning, queues are shorter, then as you get towards the middle of the day, as more people come to shop, queues get longer, middle of the afternoon it gets shorter again, and then towards the evening it might get longer. Um, or if you were to think of a, a, a local cafe such as a, a coffee shop such as Tim Hortons um, at SMU for example, uh, between classes they're fairly long line, so the demand for service varies quite a bit um, throughout the day but also um, you see part of the peaks and valleys happen during class time there seem to be some valleys and then in between classes we see some peaks in terms of waiting time all right the cyclical component as i mentioned is a repeating upward and downward movement but across several years and the random part is just what we kind of um, control uh, ourselves. We simply just don't have the ability to capture. We know that there's a random component, and that's why it's called random. We really can't predict it. So let's just uh, quickly review some of the different approaches. The naive approach, as it suggested, is a very simple methodology that could work pretty well if your demand pattern is stable. And it basically says our next period is the same as the last period. January sales were 68, then February sales might be 68. And you could sort of ex um, sort of adapt the model for different things. So, for example, in terms of trend, if February was 10% higher than January, then we'll assume March would be 10% higher than February. Uh, in terms of seasonality, we could say this January will look like last January. This February will look like last February. And so you could extrapolate seasonality to the naive model quite easily and trend as well. Okay? It's fairly um, simple to implement, so it doesn't require a whole lot of data. One thing that's fairly common, I think most people are familiar with it, is the concept of a moving average. And so all we just do is take the arithmetic mean of part of the data. So if we say we want a three period moving average as a way to forecast, um, we will predict um, April's demand by using January, February, and March and averaging the demand for those three periods. So, or if a two period moving average, we could say, let us use, um, if we're looking at daily demand, then Monday and Tuesday will average the demand for those two days to predict Wednesday's demand. And uh, so, the, so the approach in terms of moving average is fairly straightforward as well. However, we may actually want to weight the periods um, as opposed to simply um, treating each of them equally, and that's called a weighted moving average. Uh, the weighted moving average allows us then to adjust the relative weights for um, the different periods. So, if I'm like, let's just look at a two period uh, moving average forecast, but we want to weight the things. I might decide, let's just look at monthly data, that I'm going to weight the most recent month differently from the second most recent month. So if I want to predict m March's demand from a two-period moving average, I would need February and January's demand. But because February's demand is more recent, I might decide to weight February's demand a lot higher. And so I might decide to use a 60-40 split where I put a 60% weight on February and a 40% weight on January, or a 70% weight on February and a 30% weight on January. So we could actually shift the weighting away from just equally weighted, where if I simply took the average of January and February, then the equivalent weights are basically 50% each. 0.5 and 0.5, okay?
So we have that opportunity to do that. And here's an example of, um, I believe this is a, a three-period moving average. And we have our demands, 10, 12, and 13, but we are using different weights uh, for them. We use a, a weight of three for the most recent, two for the next one, and one for, for the furthest value. And we divide by six, and that's because our weights add up to six. But we don't have to, we could use this sort of approach, or just make sure our weights add up to one, and we could use decimal values like 0.7 and 0.3, we, um, or 0.5 and 0.5, or 0.4 and 0.6, and so forth. All right? Uh, there are some potential issues with a moving average, and uh, just something to keep in mind that um, the longer you make the moving average period, the less responsive it becomes because you're averaging too many periods. So you're smoothing out a lot of the fluctuations. So finding the right balance. If your moving average includes one period, then this is a naive approach. If you have two periods, then you're going slightly beyond the naive approach. You would not, you'll be less responsive, but still reasonably responsive. But then if you went to three, four, five period moving averages, then you really are starting to minimize the effect of, um, or certainly smooth out the fluctuations, which may not be very good. Um, they don't forecast trend very well, they lag trend, and they require a fair amount of historical data, okay? And we see an example done here for us. I want to talk about one other model um, called exponential smoothing. And uh, exponential smoothing is a form of weighted, a form of a weighted moving average, but where the historical data uh, declines at an exponential rate. In other words, and hence the term exponential smoothing, we incorporate that historical data at a dec at an um, decreasing exponential rate. So, for example. Um, so, so what happens is that the model keeps uh, historical data as it goes on, but then old data is very um, is has very very little weight attached to them. Okay, and so it the model looks something like this: the forecast that we're going to generate, the new forecast, is our last period's forecast adjusted by the error that we made. Now, what is the error? The error is really the difference between the last period's actual and the last period's forecast. So that's an error. So if my last actual was 100 and I forecasted 90, I have 10 units of error. And I'm going to adjust my forecast now by a fraction of that error. So alpha is between 0 and 1. Okay? If I made alpha 0, I'm not making any adjustment. So this goes out of the picture. And my next period forecast will be the same as my last period forecast. In other words, I'm not changing a anything. If I make alpha equal to 1, then what happens is that the ft minus 1 will disappear because you have plus ft minus 1. If this value is 1, then you'll have negative ft minus 1, and those two will cancel out, leaving you with just at minus 1. So your forecast will be the last period's actual, which is basically the naive method. All right? So what you want to do is to find a happy medium in there. So you need to select a value for alpha. And it's not always easy to just guess what it is. You may need to do some experimentation, uh, which means you try different values of alpha, take a look at the forecast and see how accurate they are, and then settle on a value. In Excel, we could use Solver to optimize the value of alpha for us, but we have to provide some sort of criterion that we will use to assess the quality of the forecast. And we'll come to those a little later in the uh, material. Uh, here's, a, here's an example of exponential smoothing. We have a predicted demand of 142, the actual demand, which is basically our forecast, Actual demand was 153, so you can see there's an error. And here's our adjustment, 20% of that error we're going to add to the next period. So our next forecast is just 142 plus 20% of the error that we committed. And uh, we have a forecast of 144 cards.
in this case. All right. What does moving constant do for us? And this is what I was suggesting to you happens to, if you look here, what happens to the historical data. All right. So when alpha is 0.1, you could see as we go back, the values are decreasing. Right. And then if you look at as you increase the um, as you increase the value of alpha, we begin to see as we go back, historical data is now decreasing at at a, at, a, at, a, at an even faster rate. As by the time we got to the three periods back, four periods back, and so forth. If we keep going, we will see even an even further decline. Okay, uh, what? this moving constant does, it basically dampens for us the um, responsiveness of a prediction. So 0.5 would be a fair amount of damping. 0.1, sorry, 0.1 would be a fair amount of damping because we're adding only a small amount of the error. 0.5, we're adding more of the error so it allows us to be a bit more responsive. So you have to decide just how much damping you want in your forecast, all right? So choose high values of alpha when you believe that the forecast is likely to change. I mean, the underlying average will change, but use low values of alpha when things are fairly stable. There's not a lot of need for movement in a case like that, all right? The objective in choosing alpha is to obtain the best forecast possible, and you could do that for experimentation or for the use of um, solver in Excel. So we're going to pause here and then continue with errors in forecasting in our second video.